I think we are on track, even if there were no algorithmic improvements from here, even if we just scaled up what we had so far, uh, I think the scaling laws are gonna continue and I think that's gonna lead to amazing improvements. I'm going to take you all back in time to about three, three years, years ago. Um, you, you and Tom gave me a call, one of your co-founders, and said, uh, hey, I, you know, we think we're going to go start in topic. And uh, I asked you, great, okay, like, what, what do you think we need to get going? He said, well, I think we can get by with like 500. I said, okay, I think we can find 500K somewhere. And I remember you deadpan <laughs> saying, dude, I'm talking about $500 million. <laughs> And that's when I, I realized that things were going to be a little bit different. You know, most people here know you as the founder of Anthropic. I think it'd be helpful to just hear how we got there. Yeah, I mean, I started in a very different field. Uh, I was initially an undergrad in physics. I just wanted to understand the universe. AI wasn't even on my radar. It seemed like science fiction. Um, near, near the end of my undergrad, I started looking very carefully at Moore's Law, I read the readings of the works of like Ray Kurzweil and felt like there was something there and that AI was really going to go somewhere, but I didn't really know how to work on it. You know, the big thing in those days was like support vector machines. It didn't, wasn't anything that seemed very exciting. So I decided to go to grad school in neuroscience because that was, you know, the closest thing to an intelligence that I could actually uh, study. And near the end of Near the end of grad school, I started to see all this stuff about, you know, AlexNet and QuarkNet mm -hmm. and it was actually, that it was actually starting to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I ended up joining uh, Andrew Ng's group at Baidu that worked on speech recognition. Then I went to, I was at Google Brain for a year. Uh, and then I was one of the first folks to join OpenAI. And I was there for about, for about uh, five years. And that, that takes us to, you know, to, to the founding of Anthropic. What was it that, the, at that moment, you know, sort of when, when you, got, you, and, you and the team at OpenAI had start publishing you know, your first experiments uh, towards the end of that five-year period you just talked about around scaling laws that gave you so much confidence that this was going to hold when, when everybody else just thought that was crazy talk. Yeah, so for me, the moment was actually GPT-2 in 2019 uh, where, you know, there were two different perspectives on it, right? When we put out GPT-2, you know, some of the stuff that was considered most impressive at the time was, oh my God, you give this five examples, just offer it straight into the language model, five examples of English to French translation, and then you put a six sentence in English and it actually translates it into French. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, it actually understands the pattern. Uh, that was crazy to us, even though the translation was was terrible. It was almost worse than if you were to just take a dictionary and substitute word for word. Uh, but, you know, our view was that, look, this is the beginning of something amazing because there's no limit and you can continue to scale it up. And there's no reason why the patterns we've seen before won't continue to hold. The objective of predicting the next word is so rich and there's so much you can push against that it just absolutely has to work. And then some people looked at it and they're like, you made, you made a bot that translates really badly. It was just, I think, two very different perspectives on the same thing. And we just like really, really believed in the first perspective. And I think sort of famously what happened then was you, you saw uh, a reason to continue down that line of inquiry, which resulted in GPT-3. And what would you think was the most dramatic difference between GPT-3 and, and the previous efforts? Yeah, I mean, I think it was much larger and mm. scaled up to a substantial extent. I think the thing that really surprised me was the Python programming, where the, you know, the conventional wisdom right. uh, is that these models couldn't reason at all. Uh, and when I saw the Python programming, even though it was very simple stuff, even though a lot of it was stuff you could memorize, you know, you could, you could put it in kind of new, new situations, come up with something that isn't going to be anywhere in GitHub. And it was just showing the beginning of being able to do it. And, and so uh, I felt that that ultimately meant that we could keep scaling the models and they would get very good at reasoning. What was the moment at which you realized, well, okay, we, we, it's sort of working at, with 
to, the, to, to a prototypical level with reasoning. But we think this is actually, uh, with, with Python program, we, we think this is actually going to generalize much broader than we expect. What were some of the signals there that gave you that conviction? I think one of the signals was that we hadn't actually done any work. We had just scraped the web and mm. there was enough Python data in the web to get these good results. When we looked through it, it was like, you know, it's hard to estimate, but it was something like, you know, maybe 0.1% to 1% of the data that we scraped was Python data. So the, the conclusion was, well, if, if it does so well with so little of our data and so little effort to curate it on, on our part, it must be that we can enormously amplify this. Mm. Uh, and, and so that, that, just, that just made me think, well, okay, we're getting more compute, we can scale up the models more, and we can greatly increase the amount of data that, that is programming. So, so, so we have so many ways that we can amplify this. And so, of course, it's gonna work. It's just, it's just a matter of time. All right. You and the team acted very strongly on that impulse to pursue scaling laws. We fast forward now two years, and it's just sort of hard to fathom the sheer amount of progress that's happened in like 24 months. When we start looking out, maybe, yeah, with the next 24, 36 months, what do you think the biggest bottlenecks are in demonstrating that the scaling laws continue holding? Yeah, so I think, I think there's uh, three elements. There's, uh, there's data, mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, compute, and there's algorithmic improvements. Uh, so I think we are on track, even if there were no algorithmic improvements from here, even if we just scaled up what we had so far, uh, I think the scaling laws are going to continue. And I think that's going to lead to, you know, uh, kind of amazing improvements that uh, it's, uh, you know, that everyone, including me, is prone to underestimate. Um, I think the biggest factor is simply that more money is being poured into it. The most expensive models made today cost about a uh, hundred million dollars, say plus or minus a factor of two. Um, I, I think that next year we're probably gonna see from multiple players models on the order of $1 billion. And in 2025, we're gonna see models on the order of several billion, I don't know, perhaps even perhaps even $10 billion. Um, and so I think that that factor of 100 plus the compute inherently getting faster with the H100s, uh, that's been a particularly big jump because of the move to lower precision. So you put the, all those things together and if the scaling laws continue, there's gonna be a huge increase in capabilities. Yeah, you, you, you pointed out consistently that if we just scale our current architectures, we get there. Um, what do you think end up unlocking uh, sort of performance while allowing the, the ability for these models to be more efficient um, from an architectural perspective? Do you think we need a fundamentally new approach to, to what's going on? I think my basic view is that inference will not get that much more expensive. The simple, you know, the basic logic of the scaling laws is that if you increase compute by a factor of n, you need to increase data by a factor of square root of n mm -hmm. and uh, size the model by a factor of square root of n. Um, so that square root basically means that the model itself does not get that much bigger and the hardware is getting faster while you're doing it. So I think these things are gonna to continue to be servable for the next three or four years. If there's no architectural innovation, they'll get a little bit more expensive. I think if there's architectural innovation, which I expect there to be, they'll get somewhat cheaper. What is the skill set and the talent required to unlock those architectural innovations? And for a long time, this was not sort of well understood, but you had this sort of physicists only leaning. Um, what is it about the training of physicists or the, what's in the water there that made you so convinced that the early, you know, four out of the first seven co-founders had physics backgrounds, not traditional AI or machine learning backgrounds. So, so my view is basically that there's two kinds of fields at any given point in time. Uh, there's fields where an enormous edifice of experience and accumulated knowledge has been built up and you need many years to, uh, you know, become an expert in that field. The canonical example of that would be biology very hard to, you know, contribute groundbreaking or Nobel Prize work in biology if you've only been a biologist for six months. Then there are fields that are very young or that are moving very fast. AI was and is, still is to some extent very young um, and is definitely moving very fast. Hmm. Uh, and, and so when that's the case, really talented generalists can often outperform those who have been in the field for a long time because things are being shaken up so much. If, if anything, having a lot of prior knowledge can be a disadvantage. Uh, and, and so because several of our co-founders were physicists, we thought that was at least one pool of people, not that there aren't others. 
where, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of raw talent without necessarily experience in the field. Um, and, and, you know, that's that's generally borne out. We've hired a number of them. We have statistics on it like, you know, it, it works. I remember when when that was in the early days of building the company, there was this very strong belief you had that if we got enough physicists and a few infrastructure engineers um, in the same room, then we could scale um, much. We could scale the quality of the output much, much faster than teams that might be bigger, better resourced and so on. Um, we fast forward now to, you know, you, you've, you're starting to become a fairly well-resourced company and a team. Um, what is it that you think is, is the hardest to maintain in your talent pool as you start scaling beyond that, you know, hundred person full-time employee mark? Yeah. I mean, I think as companies get larger, uh, basically everything gets harder, right? So our, our general view is, you know, talent density beats talent mass every time, mm. but of course, particularly on the commercial side, maybe less so on the research side, but particularly on the commercial side, you just need to do things. You have a list of customers. You need one person to serve this customer and one person to serve this customer. And you know you have a list of features and you need one person to implement this feature and one person to implement that feature. And those, those, numbers, those numbers add up. So I think the challenge is just to maintain that very high level of talent density as you, as you scale. And I think we've done very, very well at that so far. Uh, you know, we, we always have debates among, among the leadership team. Oh my God, we're growing too fast. We can't possibly maintain the, you know, the, the talent bar. We've always managed to do it in the past, but it's a constant tension. I think it'd be helpful to take a few minutes to just hear, you know, um, your belief about constitutional AI, which is sort of the regime you proposed earlier yes. this year. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about the implications of what that means for the safety in the future of, yes. of these models. So the method that's been kind of dominant for steering the values and the outputs of AI systems uh, up until recently has been RL from human feedback. Uh, I was one of the like, co-inventors of that at OpenAI, but since then it's been you know, improved to, to power ChatGPT. And the way that method works is that uh, humans, give, uh, humans give feedback on model outputs, say which model outputs they like better. And over time, the um, you know, the, the, the model learns what the humans want and learns to emulate what the humans want. Constitutional AI, you can think of it as the AI itself giving the feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of human raters, you have a set of principles. And, you know, our, our set of principles is in our constitution. It's very short. It's five pages. We're constantly updating it. There could be different constitutions for different use cases, but this is where we're starting from. Uh, and e whenever you train the model, you simply have the AI system uh, uh, read the constitution, look at some task, like, you know, summarize this content or give your opinion on X, and it'll say, uh, you know, the AI system will complete the task. And then you have another copy of the AI system say, okay, was this in line with the constitution or was it not? Hmm. A at the end of this, if you, if you train it, the hope is that the model acts in line with this guide star set of principles. So as a result of that approach, you know, the seed of the constitution captures some set of values of the constitutional authors, right? What does, how are you grappling with the debate that that means you are imposing your values on the constitutional system? Yeah, a, a, couple, a couple directions in that. So when we took, first when we took the original constitution, um, you know, we tried to add as little of our own content as possible. We added things from like the UN Declaration on Human Rights, um, you know, just kind of like generally, generally agreed upon kind of, you know, deliberative principles, um, some principles from like Apple's ter terms of service. And they're, they're very vanilla. I mean, you know, they're, you know, they're things like, you know, produce content that, you know, would be acceptable if shown to children or things like this, or, you know, don't violate fundamental human rights. I think from there, we're going in two directions. One is that different use cases, I think, demand different operating principles um, and maybe even different values, like a psychotherapist probably behaves in a very different way from a lawyer. Hmm. So the idea of having a, a kind of very simple core and then specializing from there in different directions uh, is, is kind of a way not to have this, um, you know, this, 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 kind of, this kind of mono constitution that applies to everyone. Second, we're looking into the idea of, I don't want to say crowdsourcing, but some kind of deliberative democratic process mm. uh, whereby people can, can design constitutions. To folks who aren't sort of privy to what's going on inside of Anthropic, you can often seem paradoxical, 
because you're you know you're going. Um, we've we found a way to efficiently sort of scale and keep the scaling laws uh, proceeding. At the same time, we're we're big advocates of of making sure that this doesn't happen very fast. Um, what what is the what is the thinking behind that paradox? Um, I think one of the things that most drives the trade offs is, and you see it a bit in constitutional AI, that the solution to a lot of the safety problems, the best solutions we found almost always involve AI, AI itself. Hmm. So, you know, there's a community of very theoretically oriented people who tries to work on, a on AI safety kind of separate from the development of AI. And at least my assessment of this, I don't know if others would say it was fair, is that that, that hasn't been that successful. And that what, what the, the things that have been successful, even though there's much more to do, and we've only made limited progress so far, are areas where AI has kind of helped us to make AI safe. Now, why would that happen? Well, as AI gets more powerful, it gets better at most cognitive tasks. One of the relevant cognitive tasks is judging the safety of AI systems, eventually doing safety research. Mm. So there's this, there's this kind of self-referential component to it. And we even see it with areas like interpretability, looking inside the neural nets, where we, we thought at the beginning, we've had a team on that since, since the beginning, that that would be very separate. But I think it's converged in two ways. One is that powerful AI systems can help us to interpret the neurons of weaker AI systems. So again, there's that recursive process. And second, uh, that interpretability insights often tell us a bit about how models work. Hmm. And when they tell us how models work, they often suggest ways that those models could be better or more efficient. Um, so these things are kind of very intertwined with each other. You know, we're still working on kind of frameworks for this, both regulatory and following it our, ourselves. But, but one broad way that we've been thinking about it from the beginning and are probably going to work more on formalizing it over the coming months and years is this idea of sort of safe scaling or checkpointing. So there could be this kind of alternating step where you advance a level in capability and then there's a gate where you have to show, okay, if you want to get to the next level, you have to show that your model has certain safe mm. properties. And what do you think is the biggest trade-off by taking the path of the, uh, let's implement the gates? Yeah, right? I mean, I think we, we think we need to be careful to, you know, not put in a bunch of red tape that, mm. isn't, that isn't necessary. If this is like, you have to fill out a thousand pages of pa paperwork and get 15 different licenses from different bodies to, you know, to make an AI system, that's, that's never gonna work. That's gonna slow things down. You know, other adversaries, you know, authoritarian countries will get, will get ahead of us. So I don't think we can do that. But if you look to things like, I don't know, like airplane safety or auto safety, hmm. like, you know, to the extent that regulations have ever done a good job of balancing, hmm. uh, you know, allowing things to move forward with, you know, yeah, people could die if we get this wrong. Um, I think those are examples of getting it at least relatively right. I know we could go on for hours about safety, but I'm, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to shift a little bit. You've had a very busy summer. It's been a summer of like anthropic drops, 100K context window. Um, you've, you've released Claude to it. You've, you're scaling. You're being pretty vocal about scaling the models and then exposing them to real world interactions, right? There's a room full of founders here often who are trying to understand whether they can build on top of the anthropic platform. You're building a whole ecosystem. What's the advice you'd offer folks as they're trying to figure out where Claude goes, where Anthropic goes, where the roadmap goes? Yeah, one thing that I think people are starting to realize, but I think is, is uh, still underappreciated, is the longer context and things that come along with that that we're working on, you know, mm -hmm. things in the direction of, you know, retrieval or search, really open up the ability of the models to talk to very large databases. You know, one thing we say is like, oh yeah, you can talk to a book, you can talk to a legal document, you can talk to a financial statement. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people have this, this, still this picture in mind of like, there's this chat bot, I ask it a question and it answers the question. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the idea that you can, you know, you can, you can, you can upload a legal contract and say, you know, what are, what are the five most unusual terms in this legal contract hmm. or upload a financial statement and say, summarize the position of this company. What is surprising relative to what this analyst said, said two weeks ago. So all, all these kind of knowledge manipulation and processing of large bodies of data that take hours for people, people to read, I think much more is possible with that than what people are doing. We're just at the beginning of it. And, you know, that's an area I'm excited about. I'm particularly excited about because it's an area where I think there are a lot of benefits and all the costs that we've talked about hmm. for this generation of models. I'm not too worried. 
how long in infinite context windows? Um, really, the main thing holding back infinite context windows is just, you know, as you make the context window longer and longer, of course, the majority of the compute starts to be in the in the context window. So at some point, it, it just becomes uh, too, too expensive in right. terms of compute. So we'll never have literally infinite context windows, but we are interested in continuing to extend the context windows and to provide other means of interfacing with large amounts of data. Cool. Well, we are out of time. Thank you, Dario. Thank you for having me.